I'm Andy Cummel from Chemistry and the Moore's Cancer Center, and this session is entitled Fresh Intellectual Perspectives. The first talk will be given by Stefan Tanaka on reducing unevenness and appeal for horizontal thinking. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kit, Kit and Sandy for inviting me and putting me on this. And it's kind of interesting being fresh because I'm an historian and I'm actually going to talk about the importance of the old. Um, but what I'd like to do is, is uh, the point of the, my talk would be that if we're going to deal with questions of justice, if we're going to deal with issues of innovation and change, we also have to think about how we ourselves change our own practices. And that's one of the things that, that we're trying to, to foster at the, center of the uh, at the center of the humanities. You know, I don't use PowerPoint, so which one? Arrow. Oh, arrow, okay, okay. Um, yeah, technologically. So technologically challenged, and what I'm about to start off with was digital media and technology is changing scholarship. <laughs> um, that's my first line. The question is how? And we, we communicate with others with email, we have more databases, we, we now publish electronically, we communicate electronically. Um, we have better search engines, we have better calculations. I mean, everybody has on our desk what five or 10 years ago was a supercomputer. Um, and we have archives for the historian that's on, largely online now. Um, I put this on the board, though, because what we've done is, is we, we're participating in a world where, we're engaged, where the computer and the technology is helping us do more, do it faster, and do it better. Um, and the question is, is to what extent does that change anything? Um, and I'm invoking here David Levy, a computer scientist who used to be at, at, at Xerox Park, and, um, and, and now at the University of Washington. And, and he, he points out, and many others have done this too, that, that what we've done is we've embraced the storage and the hypertext and the speed of the computers that Vannevar Bush uh, mentioned in, in 1945. What we've not done, though, is, is the reason for this is, is Vannevar Bush was complaining about information overload and how we could use the computers to think about um, how we use the computers to, to help us deal with the mundane so that frees us time to do what we would call the, the more creative and contemplative thinking. Um, And so this is, you know, our dilemma, is, as I see it, is we at the university are largely in the mode still of the more faster and bigger. Uh, we're evaluated based upon innovation uh, on, on new research rather than existing research, uh, or, or for, well, we don't ask questions for whom, we don't ask questions about utility, um, and um, we publish in a world into a gated community that limits the access of our research rather than uh, makes it available for everybody. Um, and, and this is historical. And, and it, it comes from the, the Enlightenment, it comes from the idea that, that time is linear, uh, and it comes from also the, the, the rise of progress as a way of thinking. Um, and uh, as I was preparing this speech, I couldn't help uh, noting that uh, the USC San Diego Radio School uh, radio ad says, never stop advancing. And I, dis I agree with that, but a different thing would be never stop learning, which changes this part of the change that I I'm talking about. Okay, and um, this is Michel Serre, who's a philosopher of science who um, talks about these kinds of issues. A and the ultimate end of that then is, is it places all of us on a treadmill. And I think, I mean, as I talk to my colleagues today, uh, I think a lot of us feel like we're churning, we're on treadmills, we keep producing stuff, and we don't have time to, to do the kinds of, of things that some of us would like to do. Um, the point of all of this then is, or, or part of raising this is that we have to think about time and temporality as not a, a universal linear thing, but that there is a technological time and temporality. And, and there are the temporalities of the human. And, um, 
Uh, Jörg Simmel uh, wrote this in 1900, and that's why I'm saying this is not fresh. This is a fairly old thing. Um, so we have to think about then that, that humans are organized around different temporal scales. We have our biological times, we have our cycles, um, and we have our families, we have our personal times. I always like to say that my life is not linear, but my biography is, or my career is. Um, and there's a difference there. They're, they're related, um, but, and, and they overlap, but they should never be considered simul, uh, coeval as if they're the same thing. Um, and so the implication of this, then, that I'd like to draw on is that the way we think about change can, um, can lead to reinforcement of the existing system, um, more, bigger, better, solve certain kinds of problems, but it doesn't necessarily change things. Um, or, and, and my favorite is uh, a computer scientist uh, who wrote in, in, in the 1980s, uh, this is Rob Kling, that computers enhance the existing organization. So if your mode of organization is efficient, you become more f efficient. If your mode of organization is disorganized, like my office, I become more disorganized. So the, my plea then is that um, we, we think about thinking and innovation change also in lateral terms. Um, that uh, Craig McKenzie talked about the, the idea of the, the great idea coming to us all of a sudden is usually something that, that has germinated, that, that is maturing, uh, and it comes from a whole network of individuals and ideas that are in the air and come together at a certain time, often through collaboration or, or discussions with other people. Um, uh, the uh, psychologist Philip Tetlock argues, or has written a book, um, that uh, experts are less likely to predict the future than those who, who know uh, many little things and draw from a, an eclectic array of traditions uh, rather than the experts. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that or not, but nevertheless, it's, it's provocative for all of us. Um, uh, David Edgerton, an historian, as we think about the nature of change, um, <coughs> says, uh, calling for innovation is paradoxically a common way of avoiding change when change is not wanted. Uh, and you could think about all the corporations that are calling for change and innovations when all they're trying to do is to maintain their own system. Um, we have to think about usability. A lot of times usability is more important than uh, the technology. Uh, th there's the number of horses. Uh, Germany used more horses in, in the Russian advance, and, and of course they, they lost that, so maybe this was the problem. Um, but then, then mechanized vehicles. They had about 500,000 horses. Um, the other thing is cost effectiveness. And the Manhattan Project, this is the atomic bomb, uh, cost $2 billion. Uh, and it destroyed part of Tokyo, 100,000 people were killed. Uh, it, it did not force the leaders, so the leaders did not decide, oh, they dropped an atomic bomb and we're gonna surrender. There were other factors that were more important, and the US Strategic Bombing Survey just after that uh, said that 220 B-29 bombers carrying incendiary devices could have done the same amount of damage, and for a lot less money. So what, um, I'd like to just emphasize here then is that what the Center for Humanities has done is to try and foster people to talk across different disciplines, across different divisions, and to uh, come up with, in a sense, risky or, or um, ideas that might pan out and they might not pan out. Uh, we have, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by Adam Burgasser because he's working with a, a, a media artist as well as a, a visual artist. On, on, that they call Project Planetaria. Uh, Mary Devereaux is, is looking at the importance of literature in both medical education as well as, well as medical practices. You know, um, and um, I, I'm not gonna talk about what we're trying to do is change the nature of, of scholarly publishing where we no longer publish by the book but we use digital media and, and, and by opening that up 
We, we produce in multimodal things. It changes the nature of historical scholarship. We have to think about audiences. And um, one of the things that, this is one of my favorites. I was at University of Seattle. This is where I started my graduate career. I didn't end up there. Um, this, this is an incredible website that has had an impact on public policy laws in Seattle. It's used by all sorts of different people. And um, it's had four million hits. Now, that's a lot more than all of my research combined in, in terms of readership. Thank you very much. <laughs>